it is important that uh, we make sure that as we go through that we retain all these wonderful women doctors who are now coming into the system. We're training more than 50% women as medical students. And in the College of Surgeons, for the last 25 years, we've had women in surgical training, which is a support mechanism to try and ensure that those women feel empowered to go on with their careers. But despite that, we're really almost uh, less than 10% in the major surgical specialties like general surgery and trauma and orthopedics, my own specialty. Women don't see themselves as fitting into surgery for a whole variety of reasons. Part of it is characteristics, part of it is environment, and of course, part of it is lifestyle. In the workplace, women are much less uh, likely to put themselves forward to actually take on uh, the next stage of their career unless they're positively encouraged to do that. I really used to think that it wasn't a problem, that all you had to do was work really hard, that all you had to do was to be really good, and all you had to do was just to keep going. And I now realise that that's not enough if we want to change the way we are in terms of women in surgery. Unless there are significant male sponsors, we are not going to make the impact we really need. Yes, women can sponsor women, but what we need to do, and this is something I commit to today, is I'm going to go out and I'm going to have conversations with five men, and I'm going to say, what you must do is go out and sponsor women. I think one of my cultural changes that I need within the health service to improve the lot of women and the lot of everybody is to develop an education culture, a supportive culture that encourages people to learn to be their best and to do their best. So that's one of the things I want to do. The second is that women are not empowered uh, and neither are other minority groups in medicine. So another culture change that I think we need in the health service to, to change our lot is for people to feel empowered in, in what they do. Another culture change that we need to have within the NHS is to engage with all of the different people that work in the organisation, because we don't. Um, so we need to change our culture to be engaging, to support each other, to, to listen to each other. People in president's roles in, in medical royal colleges, I hope, have influence. And you can influence by changing the structure. So things that I've done... Um, so far is to look at the gender balance and the ethnicity balance on our committees. It's not looking quite good enough. To ensure that all of our committees have a five-year term of office and that people can't come in and sit in roles and stay in them for 20 years, so it allows new people to come in at, at the bottom. Every role is now advertised in the President's bulletin, so it's no longer a tap on the shoulder, you, like, you look like a good chap, would you like to come and do this job? So the, the, that doesn't happen anymore. Transparency um, of appointments and transparency of the way that things are done and transparency of things like who's remunerated for what they do and who isn't is, is another thing that, that, that um, we're changing. People ask me um, when they meet me, particularly men, why we need a Medical Women's Federation in this day and age. And my answer is that many of our members ring us up and tell, them, tell us exactly what's been happening to them in work. Bullying is still there, and particularly women seem to be very much affected by it. So I think, and my answer to them is that we are a very relevant and vibrant organisation. I'm hoping that coming here today you will agree with that. From our perspective, the important things are that we understand what is going on. We really haven't got enough information about the barriers. We know what we think they are, but we really don't know enough about them. I would echo exactly what Jane has said about transparency in appointments. It is very difficult sometimes to know exactly why certain people might be in certain roles when others have been overlooked. Changing the culture within the NHS, particularly within the medical NHS, is going to be vital. And I think that is long overdue. Within the BMA, we roughly have about 47% of our membership are women. 
And if you look at the committee membership, that's about a third. A third of our committee members are made up of women. So what we want to do was we, before we say it to the rest of the NHS, rest of society, get your house in order. You don't do enough for women in leadership, whether it's in medicine or other fields, we need to get our house in order. So I just want to share with you a few of the things that we've been doing. Uh, leadership programs for the current leaders of the BMA, and we also have a co-leadership program promoting the future leaders. So if the culture doesn't change today, let's get this right for the future at least. We have committee mentorship program and um, in terms of an induction scheme for new members to get involved. If the wall is already there, new members will never be able to get involved. So what we needed to do was put in systems in place to get members who were interested in doing things, anybody who wants to be a leader within the association, within the wider NHS, you come in and you attend any committee you want as long as you belong to that uh, branch of practice. We've created a family friend, a family friendly fund of uh, 100,000 pounds from the first year, and a complete child and supported adult care for anybody who wants to get involved with the BMA committees. So if you're a committee member and you have childcare commitments and you can't come to the meetings, BMA will provide those for you. We're also looking at various other initiatives, initiatives that are similar to the Royal College of Physicians about making sure there's some caps to memberships. A turnover of committees. You cannot have members being part of committees from the day they were a medical student until they become a retired member and then join Retired Members Forum and not give anybody else a look in. It is fantastic that we have so many women at the top, but we cannot be complacent. Um, you know, having talked to so many and looked at women, looked at the data um, for a long time, you know, there are uh, cumulative disadvantages that women face and subconscious bias, which we've talked about and is incredibly difficult to articulate. But we all have those stories, like my senior partner when I was in general practice juggling the jobs, jobs told me that I should get a job like his wife. Um, you know, we all know that that subconscious bias exists. But we're ambitious, we're ambitious, we want to overcome it. And I don't think that just leadership development, as, as, as good as it is and as much as we need it, and I put on action and learning sets for women on CCGs, it will not crack through that, that, that subconscious bias and the systems, the, the, the structural systems that we face. We need organisational support. And I think that the benefits of having women at the highest level is that we add a broader perspective to improve patient care. That is what we're here for. That is what we care about. And we can make our voices heard at the highest level to improve the thing that we are passionate about, which is care for our patients. But also we make best use of a really precious workforce um, and talent when the NHS is so financially challenged.